My topic is, um, I guess, bypass after endovascular failure. And we kind of have a little bit of a sense of the failure modes. I think one of the, the most important uh, components of the assessment is the clinical presentation of that failure. And it's funny because in the disease process of PAD that manifests as claudication, durability of the procedure, the patency, plays a very, very pivotal role long term, because you would assume that patency dependence uh, claudication, when you fail the patency, you will have recurrent claudication. That's not the case sometimes. The same thing in critical limb ischemia, and uh, you may need actually a shorter time uh, in order to heal or accomplish certain things. So that's the talk. All right, so when we perform lower extremity peripheral revascularizations, we actually change the natural history of the disease process. Uh, when we take endovascular therapy, they can either uh, success or fail. When, um, and this is kind of the topic of this um, uh, lecture. How, how do I manage this? It doesn't seem to be with this. And I'm going forward. Just, yeah. just click, just click. Clicking, yeah, all right. Click so fail, uh, fail endovascular procedure is part of the component. And then when you go to lower extremity bypass, uh, they also can success and fail, and the idea is whether uh, a prior fail endovascular therapy affects the performance of a lower extremity bypass. It's a very significant time delay. So the two components is fail endovascular therapy and whether that fail endovascular therapy compromises the performance of a bypass. Next slide, please. Thank you. So in this room, I think everybody knows that every patient is an endovascular candidate. Next, please. Just some are better than others. Next, please. So many ways to go around things. Next, please. So the Society for Vascular Surgery has contributed in terms of selection process, and we support the notion of treatment for uh, intermediate claudication when pharmacologic of exercise therapy has failed, as Dr. Olin showed at the beginning. They also share with us that the intervention that we do has to last. It can be a short-lived intervention. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, we also recommend endovascular interventions as a first line of therapy in intermediate claudication in patients who present with autoidiac recursive disease. Next slide. And there are some caveats. Next slide. When there is involvement of the common femoral, and we talk about this in the first uh, case presentation, we, the surgeons, tend to gravitate towards endo-open endo approach to uh, common femoral artery. And there are some other, next slide, please. Uh, they also recommend some direct reconstruction when there is autoelic occlusive disease. And in younger patients, next slide, recommend a shared decision. Next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, in terms of femoropopatial segment, uh, for focal disease, we endorse management of endo with endovascular therapy, again, in those patients who have failed medical therapy. But we are very careful about the origin of the SFA, and we really worry about the profunda. So again, for us, a little bit outside the, the comfort zone. Next slide, please. They also, is a recommendation, would recognize very hostile environments for endovascular performance in terms of durability of the procedure, maybe bypass will be a better uh, option for patients with significant diffuse hemopatial disease, heavily calcification, long segment uh, occlusions, all these things that we've been telling you to do uh, because technology continues to push forward, uh, but maybe bypass first time around maybe is something that we need to think about. Next slide, please. Now, for critical limb ischemia, it's a whole different ballgame in terms of outcomes, but there is some recommendations from the uh, global guidelines about when to offer open bypass, and it's usually when there is large burden of disease in terms of anatomy, and there is high uh, presentation rates in terms of the Wi-Fi staging. Next slide. But when you throw the patient into the mix, uh, you see that maybe the venous uh, conduits are not available or the patient is a high-risk surgical patient. Therefore, we may need to do endovascular procedures in patients who are not uh, you know, the best milieu for that. Next slide. So failure definition is the state of condition of not meeting a desirable or intended outcome. Uh, the clinical outcomes for claudication are improving ambulatory uh, distance for critical limb is healing of the wounds, avoiding major amputation or relieving of rest pain. Now the immediate technical success is obviously paramount and the long term is about primary, uh, primary or primary system patency. And we again, we, we like the, these patients, particularly in the claudication, to last for a long time. Next slide. So failure is not an option. We all like to think that. 
But as Dr. Uh, Karocha just uh, described, reality is ruthless and we will be dealing with this. Now, one key point is they have to be symptomatic. Asymptomatic hemodynamic failures merit no treatment whatsoever, in my opinion. Now, approaches after patient evaluation, there is a portfolio to be offered for these patients, but we're concentrating on essentially repeat intervention. But I want to get your attention that not everybody who has a symptomatic uh, EVT failure will be a candidate for a repeat intervention, okay? There are conservative management, secondary amputations needed, and palliative care, which we've written about. Now, in terms of repeat intervention, we can do either redo endovascular therapy or secondary bypass. Next slide, please. Next slide, next slide, next slide. Keep going. Thank you. All right, excellent. So, what is the big deal about endovascular failure? Are we burning any bridges? Well, I will submit to you that if we have a technical failure without any complications, probably we're not been burning any bridge whatsoever. Now, when we have post-technical success and then in long-term follow-up, we have loss of patency, then there is the hypothesis that damaging outflow, uh, compromising outcome of subsequent bypasses, burn opportunities for bypasses, maybe the location of the target uh, will change. And some paper quotes up to 45% of change of that uh, in some instances. And there's some other hypothesis about residual hypoglobal state that may have been uh, demerited. Next slide, please. So I will be showing you papers that supports the notion that if you perform an autoiliac reconstruction open, actually by femoral bypass grafting, after a previously uh, failed EVT, the bypass will do worse. Next slide. And I'll show you a paper that shows that actually the bypass will not do worse. Show you the next slide. And this is for femoropopetial disease, and I'll show you that if you do an open bypass after a failed EVT, your bypass will do worse. Next slide. Next slide. And I'll show you a paper that says not only that, but also if I do a bypass after a previous failed bypass, the secondary bypass do worse. Next slide. And I'll show you a paper that shows that if you do a bypass after a failed EVT, your bypass will not be effective. Next slide. Although that's a particular very elegant uh, paper from Tidawi, it's only a 30-day. I'm very much looking forward to the long-term data. Now, I'll show you in this slide that actually when you compare re-interventions, the re-EVT intervention has the same male outcomes, meaning major adverse limb effects, uh, adverse events, compared to secondary bypass, even straight greater saphenous vein bypasses or arm bypasses. But the male... The, I'm sorry, the MACE, the cardiac, the systemic complications is actually lower when we do re-EVT interventions. So that's a little bit of thinking for you guys in terms of safety profile, not effectiveness. No difference in effectiveness, but safety may be a little bit better in those patients that uh, undergo redo EVT. Next slide. And uh, a little bit more granular data specifically on the TBL disease and this uh, group in Texas that actually published extensively on this particular subject and says that, next slide, when uh, for critical limb ischemia for TBL brain interventions, maybe bypass, it's better because they last longer and accomplish better amputation-free survival. Next slide, please. So in terms of all the data, I think I can support either bias that you had prior to this. The highest evidence of data on this particular subject comes from a recently published meta-analysis in the European vascular that shows, that pulls data from 11,000 patients. Next slide. That proves that when you have a secondary bypass versus a primary bypass, a primary bypass does better on early amputation, on early graft occlusion, next slide, and on amputation-free survival. And that's the highest level of evidence we have today. So if we were to define a secondary bypass or receive a primary bypass based on this particular data, you'll be probably biased to getting an open bypass the first time around. Next slide. So in summary, I think the endovascular for autoiliac glucose disease, the endovascular therapy first is supported by the guidelines. Uh, the overall management of uh, and history of failed EVT is not really reported correctly, but in those patients who are selected to have reintervention, the effect of prior EVT intervention remains controversial at best. The reported data on bypass after failed EVT shows that it's feasible. Most do not include actually femoral bypass grafting, which I'll talk to you guys later on. It's not granular enough to offer guidelines regarding the, either the current role of primary bypass in this section, in this setting, or the effects of a prior EVT in the performance. Next slide. So my approach is, first and foremost, the patients have to be symptomatic. Second, if it's feasible, I will actually approach them endoluminally. And it's because, really, it's just less systemic complication. If it's not feasible, then if I stratify the risk of the patient, and I will select the revascularization accordingly. Next slide. 
Now for phenylpropetiol failures, again, endovascular therapy first will continue to play a major role. Uh, guidelines support a selective approach, but I have the feeling that in this room, particularly maybe we don't adhere as guidelines as much. Uh, the overall management of the failed EVT for phenylpropetiol disease is not really reported properly as well. The actual percentage of patients uh, that are candidates for any intervention is actually unknown. Next slide. But what we do know is in meta-analysis, there is an increase in major amputation rate at one year in secondary bypasses. This most likely reflects really the complexity of the disease process, the indications, and the inherent multiple variables that are in the decision-making process of candidacy for interventions in FEMPOP and, and autoerectile disease as well. Next slide. So my approach to this, you have to have a symptomatic fail uh, EVT. If it's feasible, re-intervention endoluminally is my first re-intervention. If it's not feasible, then we offer bypass, although in some cases they won't be bypass candidate because they lack, they lack uh, venous conduit. So we'll use prosthetic, which is certainly a very poor option compared to. Or if the patients are at very high risk and not arterial to arterial option, then they go into a palliative limb care or a venous arterialization procedure, which I think the next frontier for people with no arterial to arterial option. Next slide. So final thoughts, what is very, very clear from the data, next slide, is reinterventions, no matter which type, underperform. Next slide. We have to get it right the first time around. So efforts to identify the best first procedure must continue. And sadly, next slide, is very complex to design the individual therapy tailor. And that's therefore the basal and the best CLI and all these trials that we're trying to accomplish do not incorporate the myriad of data that we need to process in order to decide. So at the end of the day, it's gonna be up to you guys, up to us to decide what is the best therapy for that particular patient. Thank you very much for your attention.